All right, so this is a lightning talk. Uh, it's called ShamWow uh, because it's about the SHA-2 algorithm. Uh, and I was sort of goofing around one day looking for a project, a little, you know, bored on a weekend. I was like, eh, I should do something that's not, you know, staring at the internet, staring at Reddit again. And I started thinking about hashes uh, and why do hashes exist and how do they exist and what do they do and how do they actually work? Like you put in any amount of data and you get back the exact same size string for any sort of thing. They're all different, you know, like, and I think, I think Shattered had just hit the news as well where they'd broken, um, SHA-2 for the first time with the duplicate uh, PDF, or the different PDFs that had the same uh, SHA-2 hash that come out the other side. I'm like, well, how do they do that? Is that part of the algorithm? How does that all work? Like, why does an empty string return a meaningful hash? Like, there's no data going in. How does that do something that's not just zeros? Like, and all questions I had no idea the answers to. Uh, I have an English degree uh, by background. I have no formal training in computer science. So I didn't, if these questions are answered during that process, I didn't know them. Uh, so I decided to look it up and start reading about hashes. Uh, first, quick notes for people who don't know the, same, the answers to the questions I was asking. Uh, some of the things you want in a hash are there one way. They are not encryption. You can't get data back out of a hash. You know, hopefully, uh, you shouldn't be able to figure out when uh, something go, whatever goes in. There should be no trace of that in the output for your hash function. Uh, they're not reversible except unless if by brute force, just running all the numbers you know that you can think of, all the possible inputs to get the output, or some flaw in the algorithm itself. Uh, you also want the avalanche effect. Uh, if you change one small part of the input string, you get a completely different hash on the other side. Uh, for example, I am a cat and I am a hat have completely different you know, uh, outputs uh, in SHA-2. Uh, so the fact that you change one thing doesn't tell you if you're any closer to finding the right string. Uh, you, could ha you could have one string as a character off and you'll never know from the outputs, the output hashes. Uh, most of them to be fast in most cases. Not in all cases, but in general you want a hash to be quick, especially if you're using it for checksumming. Like if you want to say every file on this disk is correct, you want to be able to run hashes for every file very quickly and then compare them later to the, you know, if you backed up your hashes and you run them again a month later, all the hashes, should be, it should be not an incredible amount of time to find that out. In certain cases, you don't want that. Uh, for example, if you're using hashes for storing passwords, uh, you want to be very hard in order to find, to run a lot of them at once because if a, uh, someone steals your hash of your password database, you don't want them to be able to sit there and run all the possible inputs and figure out what your passwords were. So things like scrypt and other password protection hashes that are specifically for that, uh, exist and have their own use cases that I'm not going to be talking about here. And unique, it should be very hard to find two inputs that give this, uh, or two different inputs that give the same output. Uh, because then you could theoretically provide someone, oh hey, yeah, your file is, you know, has this hash, here's the file, it's actually, you know, malicious code or, uh, you know, going to, you know, start mining, your, using your computer to mine Bitcoin, or something like that. And that's why Shattered mattered, because you could say these two PDFs, are the same PDF according to SHA-2, although they are visibly different when you load them up in Adobe. Uh, so that's just some basic front level information about hashes. Uh, I'm not talking about SHA-1, but this, this was too funny not to include. Uh, I fought the SHA-1, the SHA we're not talking about it, just someone sent it to me as I was writing this talk and I thought it was very funny. Uh, so SHA, SHA stands for Secure Hash Algorithm. Uh, or standard hash algorithm, I think it's also seen used a couple times. When it was first being written, they didn't think they were going to have more than one of them. Uh, and then over time, it became clear they were going to need a new one. Uh, so originally, SHA, SHA, which was uh, released in 1993 and withdrawn shortly thereafter. Uh, the NIST, uh, National, Institute, National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, put it out there and immediately said, wait, 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 don't use that. We messed up. Uh, and came back with SHA-1 in 1995. Uh, it turns out there's a very subtle flaw in SHA-0, which is now called SHA-0, which allows it to be uh, reverse engineered uh, much more quickly uh, than they wanted. Uh, this all came out of the Capstone Project, which is the same project that gave the world the Clipper chip. Uh, that probably means nothing to 95% of you and a couple people are going, oh, the Clipper chip. So look that up if you're curious. Uh, SHA-1 came out in 1985. It was uh, 100, uh, 182 bits, I believe. I actually don't have that in my notes. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. 182 bits, I think. Uh, and it was nice. It was used in a lot of places. Git used it, for example. Uh, every file, every commit in Git is a hash. Every file is hashed using SHA-1 to test, make sure it's the right file, all that sort of thing. Uh, SHA-2 and it's SHA-256 and its friends were released in 2001. Uh, SHA-2 and SHA-256 are very, very similar to each other. There, well, let's start here. SHA-2 is a family of algorithms. SHA-256 is the one everyone uses. Uh, it, there are other ways you can use SHA-2. SHA there's a 128-bit version, there's a 256, 200, 
60 something bit version. Like the number ones, everyone uses SHA-256, so you don't need to care about the rest of them. Uh, and the actual standard is available online from the NIST. It's that URL right there. You can find the uh, links later. Uh, it uses something called the Merkle Damsgaard construction, uh, first proposed in 1979. Uh, so it took 20 years or so for this to actually reach, you know, a standards body that people started using it for. Uh, the basic way you do it is you pad a message, you take a message, you pad it out to a standard size modulo, however many, uh, however big your message is. So if it's, you know, it's 10, you go to, you're trying to get to a 256. Uh, including the message length, you stick on the end, chunk that into blocks, compress each block, and then add each block to the running total. And at the end, you're done, you have your hash. So you're, you're smushing down the data as you go. Uh, the first rule about implementing SHA-2 is don't. Uh, seriously, you really don't want to do this unless you have some really strange reason you're working in a language. You're, if you're building your own language, sure, build yourself a SHA-2 algorithm. If not, use the built-in version from your language or your environment. If you get it wrong, you, you, who knows? Anything could happen and you don't want to get it wrong. So don't do this unless you're just toying around like I was or you have a very good reason. You'll know if you have a very good reason. So let's actually walk through the algorithm. Uh, I did it in Ruby because that was what I was using at the time. Uh, and Ruby is fine and understandable and you can read it without knowing Ruby, which is great. Uh, if you have opinions about Ruby, keep them to yourself. <laughs> uh, so uh, it says the first step is to split your input into 32-bit integers. I said, great, I'll use Ruby's uh, integers. They're not, they're not size, they're just integers. I'm like, okay, well, we'll We'll deal with that when we come to it. We'll just split this into integers, and you know, some Googling tells me that unpack B star and then take the first item will give me exactly what I'm supposed to be getting here. So we run that on hello world string, and we get back that, str that uh, list of uh, bits. So it's you know, ones and zeros, the whole actual ASCII representation. I'm gonna talk a little bit louder, try and talk over whatever that is. <laughs> uh, we'll work out the 32-bit, uh, hopefully 32-bit integers won't actually come up. If it does, we'll deal with it later. Uh, we then take the f these magic hex numbers. These are the seeds for the start of the compression algorithm inside the, uh, these are the actual seeds for the function. These are arbitrarily, arbitrarily uh, selected. They're called nothing up my sleeve numbers. Uh, these are the first 32 bits of the fractional parts of the square roots of the first eight primes, two through 19. I know, what? <laughs> Nothing up my sleeve numbers are important in hashing because you need, uh, like I, as I mentioned, you need something in order to start doing the work. Uh, you, if you have a, an empty string, for example, you need to have something you can actually run the computation on uh, and some sort of base that uh, everyone will agree upon. It doesn't matter what these numbers are. In fact, they should be meaningless, but they can't be arbitrary. Uh, DES, which is another uh, hash algorithm, uh, was considered suspect for many, many years because it was its magic numbers were totally arbitrary. No one knew why they were selected. Uh, and the NSA had provided them. Boo, the NSA. Uh, turns out they were actually chosen for a very specific reason to make it hard to break the algorithm. But the NSA didn't tell anybody why they were chosen. And so later on, people figured out, oh, it's actually hard to, you know, if they'd been to any other numbers, it would have been, it would have been you know, on this curve, it would have been easier to break the algorithm. Uh, so, it matters. Uh, it, the, the, so SHA uses those hash, those specific, the first, you know, what is it, the first, first fra 32 bits, the fractional parts of the first eight primes. Like it doesn't matter, but it just, those are the ones they picked. And so they're fine. It doesn't, it doesn't really affect anything as long as everyone agrees that those are the numbers. Um, so it'd be firstly acceptable to say, for example, the first thousand digits of pi as your, as your first input, but be very suspicious to say the, the 2,509,374,000 through the 2,510,000th distance of pi, because like, that looks like you're picking your window. Five minutes? I gotta pick up speed. All right, so we're, there's a lot of randomness we need. We need. We need all these numbers, in fact, to do the compression algorithm. Uh, doesn't matter, these are, uh, these are the first huge bits of fractional parts of the cube roots of the first 64 primes, two through 311. They're big, it's just you look them up, you use them. Here's the padding. Uh, you take the message in bits, you get the length of that, you take the message in bits, you append a one to it, you attend a zero to it, uh, to pad it out to, 60, uh, to the, the nearest 512th. Uh, you then uh, chop it up and take off that last 64 bits and then stick on the length of the original message in 64, uh, in uh, base six, or not base 64. Uh, in, uh, you set the last, eight bits, last 64 bits of the message to the length of the message originally. 
That was harder to say than it should have been. Uh, this, is, this makes the padding of the message secure because you're always taking uh, the message and sticking it on there, so you can't uh, swap out, uh, you can't pad your message with zeros, for example. Like, so I am a hat and I am a hat zero are not the same thing because of that one we stick in there. Uh, uh, unsigned 64-bit uh, length on there means that SHA-256 can be safely used on inputs as large, I believe, as two exabytes. Or something like that, it's, which is, I think, more data than the universe can hold. Uh, so the, the, you can run basically anything through SHA-256. Once we've done that, we split it into chunks of 512 and loop over the chunks for each chunk, squirt the bits into an empty array, and then turn them into 32-bit words and start massaging them. Uh, you do this math, it looks like this, and it turns out it fills up the first quarter of the array. Uh, this, the rest of the array, you start bit shifting. So this, this, the first one is just M, which you know the first 16. For the rest, you do this weird looking function, which is pulling from that giant array of, of uh, words I mentioned. The, the 312, uh, well, the first 64 primes of the first whatever. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Bit shifting uh, looks a bit like this. These are this is actually taken straight from the spec. Uh, they use six logical functions which operate on 32-bit words, as those integers I mentioned, which are represented by x, y, and z. The rest it spits back out another 32-bit word. You're always working the same 32 bits. You never move larger or smaller than that. And you're just doing various uh, right rotates. And I go wait a second. At this point, I went, what's a right rotate? I don't know. I, I know shifting. You know, I, I understand that, but I, I, what is that? Uh, here's this is what it looks like in code. This is Ruby, you know, uh, basic Ruby. Uh, for each one, you do the uh, the bitwise or sum them all together and lop off the or because you need to map it, wrap it to 32 bits. I had two bits of aha when I was doing this. First, when you're doing bitwise operations as a number, they'll never jump the tracks, uh, which I had never thought about. For example, an XOR and an AND never push bit between columns. So if you take two 32-bit integers and you do you know, bitwise operations on them, they don't get bigger than 32 bits, which I'd never thought about before, but it's obvious when you think about you know, what it's actually doing in there. Uh, so you can XOR and right rotate your heart's content without worrying about popping around outside of a 32-bit uh, scale. Secondly, since we don't actually have 32-bit unsigned integers, we can fake them using a bit mask, uh, which you just do an and by you and everything together with 32 bit minus one or f f f f f f f f, uh, and that's good enough. It turns out uh, you can well, you do all the summing and just lop off the top, the top bit. You just have the 32 bits at the end, uh, which is easier to type than one 32 times. So I just use that. Uh, right rotate. Well, here's some root, here's some right shift. Uh, here's how that works. If you've never seen that before, uh, you're basically just lopping off numbers as you go. Uh, so a rotate right is implemented like this. Uh, you have two shifts and an or in between. So that actually does this. 9 becomes 12, 12 becomes 6, 6 becomes 3, 3 becomes 9 again. You're stepping the bits through like that. Uh, it's useful in almost no context outside of cryptography. Uh, <laughs> so it just looks like that. You just keep walking it around. It's, it just, the reason is it destroys meaning. Uh, these bits mean nothing else once they've come through. Uh, so the other question is, of course, that right rotate means you have to be aware of how wide your bits are because if you, walk, if you loop around, if, well, one is different than 01 versus 001 versus the other one. So you have, to be, you have to be very careful about it. In Ruby, you have to implement it like this because you have to make sure you have your shifts correctly. Uh, and there's the actual vision of what you're doing on there at the bottom. Uh, so that's how bit masking works. Uh, you know, I'm going to skip over this because I'm running out of time, but you can look at the slides later if you're curious how this all works. You preload the numbers of that original one in there. You do this to them. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's not that, that complicated. You're, doing, you're copying right a bunch of those earlier functions. That's what it looks like in Ruby, if you were curious. You add everything together, shifting everyone back one step in the variables and doing some addition. And then you add it all back together and do it again for every single block in your message. For one block, it's easy. You do it once and you're done. And if you're not, you go back, you take those things, you're holding them for the first one, add them all together again. And then you just keep doing that. At the end, you turn it into hexadecimal, you spit it out. And that's how SHA-2 works. <laughs> that was a lot faster, I think, than that was really helpful. But all this code, including an implementation in Ruby with tests, is at uh, deltamuffle.shamwow. Uh, for code and slides. If you have questions, you can ask me at the bar later since I'm already over my time and they're making faces at me in the back row. Thank you so much. Thank you.